Good morning, everyone. Uh, we'll welcome to you, particularly if you are visiting this morning. Uh, we have Mike Baldwin with us and his wife Sue, and it's lovely to have you with us. And uh, as you came down the path, uh, we've got a beautiful garden at the front, which Mike uh, designed and, and uh, led the way for, to build that for us. More of that later. It's a big the Lord has done great things for us and we're filled with joy. I hope that rings a bell because you should have seen it on the table as you came in. Um, it's on Psalm 126. It's our thank you table. And the challenge over the next couple of weeks is to go home and think about things you want to thank God for, either in your own lives or in the church life or anything. Anything small, anything big, come and write it on the thank you table. Because that's going to be part of our annual meeting in a couple of weeks' time. Um, because it's going to be a celebration of the past year. We want to thank God for all his goodness towards us. It's a combination of an um, annual meeting and service. And it won't be a normal annual meeting and it won't be a normal service. It will be a mixture of the two. We're going to be looking back over the last year, what we've done as a church and how God's been working with us. We're going to be remembering certain events, and um, even reenacting some of those events and activities. And we're going to find out what some of the church groups have been doing over the last year. There will be some four bits, there will be two four bits. One will be the election deacons, and the other one will be the approval of the accounts. They won't take too long, it's going to be a part, part of our annual celebration looking back, but also looking forward. Looking forward to what God might have in store for us. Looking forward to what our part in that's going to be. So looking ahead, two weeks time, bring your thank yous, write them on the table next week and the week after. Thank you, John. So as we gather to worship today, we are going to, I'm going to read a, two verses from Psalm, Psalm 24. And uh, then we're going to go into our first hymn. And it's an invitation, come people of the risen King, who delight, and it's everybody, come young, come old, come those who are joyful, come those who are sad. Everyone is invited to rejoice and give thanks this morning. So if you're willing, if you're able, please stand. <coughs> Psalm 24 begins like this. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it. That's you, me, everything. The world and all who live in it. For he founded it on the seas and established it on the waters. As we respond in praise, let us give a, um, let us sing our joy this morning.
Lord, we do indeed come from different lands, from different backgrounds, different ages. Lord, we all come and we gather in this place by one spirit to worship you, to give you thanks, to celebrate your goodness to us, to bring our concerns for the world to you, and to listen to your word, to listen to what might have to bring to us too. So come by your spirit and move amongst us, we pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Mike. Morning, everybody. Morning. It's a privilege to be with you this morning. A privilege to be worshiping with you, and uh, it's a privilege to be involved with the garden. And uh, it was great because I was on another project as well, and uh, I probably get maybe one coffee a day on the other project. But here we got coffee, we got cake, about every twenty minutes. We got. <laughs> so uh, it was uh, it was excellent. Uh, liquid encouragement is and. Uh, you know, solid encouragement is really good food encouragement. So, um, I'm just going to tell you a little story in this first part, and particularly, that's, you know, for, for all ages. And uh, it's a, test, a little testimony, actually, of something that happened. And years ago, we were going through a bit of a difficult time and run a bit ragged. And we were walking around Matlock, and there was this sort of travel agent. We thought we'd need to get away, we'd get away. And so we went to Rhodes, and we were on holiday, and I thought, I need to really fast and pray a little bit. Not for two months, it was a holiday. And, <laughs> and I thought, I need to find out what God wants me to do. And while I was doing that, I had this picture, another picture of Batman. Now, it's a little bit different, like, so I didn't have your garden. <laughs> it was a bit more kind of, you know, uh, a fighting back with a little balloon above it, like the old sort of the old cartoon Batman. And so immediately, when I had that, I thought, "Oh dear, the sun's been getting to me." <laughs> and I hadn't been drinking sangria or anything like that, so it wasn't something like that. And so I dismissed it. I put it to one side and just thought, "Oh, my imagination must have been running away with me." But then, by the pool the next day, I got a little book. It was I actually found it yesterday. I was looking for a different book, Battle for the Loins, it was called. This other book, I couldn't find it. And this book, which I've been looking for for ages, there it was. And it's called People Like Us, Looking in God's Mirror. And the open the page on 100. I opened the book randomly. Which is, can be a dangerous thing if you do that. Uh, but um, the officer's Batman. <laughs> and if you want to see that, it can, it's on page 111. And basically, what it said in this book was that Gideon had a Batman, his name was Fura, or Pura, whichever way you like to say that name. And basically, what the Bible says is Pura walked with Gideon. And in fact, when, as you know, that the Israelites were surrounded by Midianites. In fact, there were so many of them, they said they were like the sands of the, of the you know, not like the, the, the grains of sand with their camels, were like the grains of sand. And that they were like locusts, they were everywhere. And maybe if it wasn't for Fura walking with Gideon and going down to the Midianite camp in the night, Maybe Gideon might not have done that, he may not have had the courage. And sometimes it takes a Batman, someone to walk alongside someone to enable them to fulfill their destiny. And so it wasn't Batman going in, punch, whack, beating up Penguin and the Riddler and all the rest of it. A Batman is someone who says, oh, I think you ought to wear this today. I think this armour today, so you need this, okay? I think you want to have your acoustic guitar instead of your electric guitar, Rochelle, today. I think if you're playing golf, you'll have the 9-9 instead of the 7 -iron. That's the Batman. The Batman is just someone who walks alongside. And you, they don't have to say anything. 
because you're walking alongside, you know they're there. Just like Jesus and the Holy Spirit, the paraclete comes alongside us, the one who walks alongside us. And so, I've got a couple of back men, or back people, it's a, a, a girl and uh, uh, a man who have been very good to me and uh, about a year ago we were going as well, they, they, they'd gone over and above to help me and I was at Garden as well live and I saw these metal bats and I thought I've got to get them a metal bat each. So I got them, one lady a metal bat, that was fine. The other chap, I couldn't deliver it. He, he said, I can, I'm not in on Friday. Can you pop around Sunday afternoon? Pop around Sunday afternoon. I'm just about to knock on the door of his house. Got the big bat in that. And an ice cream van pulls up behind me. -na 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 -na. <laughs> I looked around at the ice cream van. And I thought, I've never heard an ice cream van play Batman music before. <laughs> and so, anyway, I saw Mark, the, 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 the young lad. And I went to the ice cream man and said, why, why are you playing Batman music? I've never heard that. It's all because they don't like the ordinary ice cream music around here. They like, <laughs> they like the Batman music. And so, it's just something which has stuck with me a little bit. And that's the, the little testimony in that, that you can be a Batman. We can all be a Batman to everybody. We may not be Gideon. We may not be David. We may not be Abraham. You know, but we can certainly be that bad person to somebody, can't we? Everybody can. And on the garden, there were people who were bad people. And there are lots of people in this church. Uh, Rochelle produced this list of, I don't know, there was, there was 36 plus on this list. There are loads of you who are bad people. In fact, all of you in the room are a bad person to somebody else. There's no question about that. You're a hero to somebody else. And... What I did was, and I haven't got one for everybody, I'm afraid, but I got some bat, the bat team badges uh, produced. And at one time, I was going to sort of be very exclusive about it, but I thought, what's the point of being exclusive and narrowing it down to just a few people that you know? Be a little bit more inclusive of that and, and spread the message. You know, and so that's what, um, so what I'd like to do, uh, I wonder where Rochelle, do you want to present these to, um, I don't know if everybody's here who, who uh, I need to, so I've just got a few, and, and if you don't get one of these, we'll try and get one too, there's lots of other people, I can say to Rochelle, I'll get you some more of these, and she can give them out, because there's, there's, there's loads of you, but I'm only going to pick the, some people who, who uh, particularly in the garden, so, I don't know if Martin, I don't know if Martin's here, uh, I don't think he is, is he? He come this afternoon. But certainly Sue Millard was here. Thank you very much. Welcome to the back <laughs> Now I can't sort of, I haven't got a special one, but if I did, I would have something a little bit more special than this person, and that's Chris Elliott. Chris went over and above, and he went over and above what he needed to do, uh, and came in, and um, that's when it was a little bit more special. Then there's David Bryant, and there is Heather, Heather at the back there, I can see. So my baby, Heather. Welcome. Welcome. Super digger there, Heather. And then we've got Ashley. Ashley, yeah. Ashley, well done. Thank you. And 
Then we've got John then on, of course. John, who was there raking up, careful, tidy, making sure that the pass at the end of the day. And then we've got Fran, who shall I? Fran? Oh, I said that right, Fran, yeah. Or oh, she's just out there, okay. <laughs> okay. So, I just encourage you to be a back person to anybody you can be, really. You can all be a back man, back woman. Not cat woman, but a bad woman. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. So, before the children go out, we're just going to hear, actually, I over, I, I looked over past the um, reading, so Mike mentioned Gideon. So, where is Brian? Yeah, Brian, do, can we just come and read this couple of verses to us um, so we can hear the context of that? The reading is taken from Judges chapter 7, verses 9 to 11. And it's when Gideon is considering what to do about the Midianites and whether he should attack or not. And the reading starts during that night. The Lord said to Gideon, get up, go down against the camp, because I am going to give it into your hands. If you're afraid to attack, go down to the camp with your servant Pura and listen to what they're saying. Afterwards, you will be encouraged to attack the camp. So he and Pura, his servant, went down to the outpost of the camp. So how do we help one another, support one another, be that man, that woman to one another? Our next song is a song you may not have come across the words, but you may know the tune. Help us to help each other, Lord, each other's load to bear, that all may live in true accord our joys and pains. Share. If you are able and would like to, please stand by the
Yesterday was glorious, today is dry, and it's an opportunity to reflect on our creation, our next hymn, O Lord my God, when I in awesome wonder. Um, if you're able, please stand and let's join this together. <coughs>
have just sung of God's greatness, God's goodness. How great thou art. And as we think of God's greatness and his goodness, his faithfulness to us, the glories of his creation, so we are conscious of the ways <coughs> as human beings we have taken that creation for granted. So I'm going to lead us in a confession. And uh, if I say together, can you say, forgive us God? Twice, and then the third time is thank you, God. Okay? So let's pray. Together, forgive us, God, that we have taken your creation for granted. You have given us the run of the land, the pick of the crop, and we have squandered these resources, distributed these unfairly vandalized their beauty, violated their purity. Together we say, forgive us God, that we have taken your kingdom for granted. You have given us the seeds of faith, the fruits of the Spirit, and we have misused these resources, displayed them rarely, bestowed them grudgingly, ignored them blindly. Together we say, thank you, God, that you are stronger than our destructiveness, greater than our meanness, that you give us a fresh start, a second chance. Overwhelm us with the power of your resurrected love. Compel us with a challenging issue for change. Lead us in overcoming our own limits and restrictions and drive us towards a new life of peace, justice, and integrity. Amen. Amen. And so, Lord, even as we ask you to forgive us, so we pray. We pray for those areas of the world that through our greed are squandered are overrun with plastic. Lord, where the children spend their days picking through the rubbish heaps to find things that they might sell on. The bits of plastic that should have been recycled and yet are used for other means. Lord, as we clear out and put our stuff in our blue bins, our brown bins, our black bins, and we think it's all done, but that rubbish gets taken elsewhere. Lord, not only forgive us, but Lord, may we work to the good of the whole world, not just to the end of our gardens. And Lord, we pray for the local elections happening this week across the country. We pray for all of them standing, whether we agree with their politics or not. We pray for each one. And we pray that they would have servant hearts seeking to serve the country, seeking to serve to the best of their ability. And we pray, Father, that you would be at work across this nation. As councils are, are voted for, local councils, so we pray for Derby Council and the decisions that they have to make day by day in the limited resources that they are having to manage. Lord, give them wisdom. Lord, may they seek the good for the whole city. May their resources stretch. And may we see this city thrive, rise up, where there is darkness, where there is poverty, where there is shame, where there is greed. Lord, we pray the Spirit of, of you, your Holy Spirit, would flow through, bring healing, bring cleansing, bring restoration, we pray. And Lord, would you show us our part? in making this city 
all it can be. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Before um, I invite Mike to come and speak, we're going to sing one more hymn. God, the maker of the heavens and the planet that we share, show us how to live like Jesus, lives of gratitude and care. Again, this continues in our prayers that we have just prayed.
So we're going to have a look at vision this morning, vision. Um, and it's great to see uh, all around this building there has been vision. It's very evident when you come here. In fact, um, one of the people who worked on the gardens with us that doesn't go to church, and she was amazed at how many people used the building coming in, going out. And uh, that, that was done because some people had a vision to draw people together. And maybe they had to provide for that vision in making a room, making a garden, or whatever it was. Somebody had a vision. And uh, that's what I want to look at is, is a little bit on that. And of course, there are some beautiful, um, well-known readings that you will know. And uh, this first one. Uh, is a lovely one by Helen Carr, who you know couldn't, uh, couldn't hear and uh, uh, blind and lots of different things. And she said the only worse thing than being blind is having sight and no vision. Because we can have sight, can't we? We can have hearing, we can have different things, but if we don't sort of use it, if we don't see it, we, we lack that vision. And she had that vision to carry on and be inspiring for other people. Another of my favorite ones, which again is a well-known one, is about Walt Disney. And uh, when they finished building Disneyland, you know, there were people walking around here and someone was talking to Walt's wife. Oh, it's such a shame, isn't it? It's such a shame he didn't get to see it. And she turned to them and said, he did see it, that's why it's here. <laughs> And it's what we see in our mind's eye, and sometimes that comes through prayer, sometimes it comes by reading the Word of God, and sometimes it comes from a burden. In the book of Habakkuk, we, we read about the burden that he had for something. You might have a burden for something in this church today, a group of people, some people with some similar concerns or problems or issues or whatever it might be, and you think, we, you know, we've got to do something to cater for those people. And that's often how vision is birthed out of a burden. And uh, so those are just some examples there. And uh, there's some more examples here, of course, in the Bible. We see lots and lots of examples of vision. You remember how Abraham and his father, Terah, had stopped when God had given him uh, the vision to go to the promised land, to go to Canaan? And he stopped halfway. He kind of rested up. And we all don't do that at times, and there's a need to do that at times. But we can't get too rested up that we stay. And that's what happened to Terah. But Abraham took incredible faith, and he carried that. He carried on that moving towards Canaan and into Canaan. And of course, you are very well familiar with. Nehemiah, uh, I know you, you, you studied this recently, and it's just, it's just such a beautiful story. Of course, if you're going to have a vision, you're going to do something, you have to survey it first. You have to have a good look at the area, don't you? You have to measure it up. You have to look where the sun's coming from. You have to look where the wind's coming from, what the soil type is, if it's a garden. Where's the water coming from? Where's the electricity coming from if it's a building? You know? All these different things you've got to survey, you've got to see what's the mood of the people like. In Nehemiah's case, you know, are, are they, are, can I get them? Can I get the people on site? Can we, can I motivate them to achieve this vision? And then, of course, there's others, sorry, on that, just pop back one. <laughs> uh, there, you know, there are other people who had incredible vision. David. Okay, God didn't allow David to build the temple because of the bloodshed and different things. He gave David the vision that he, he wanted him to build the temple. He said, although you won't do it, your son Solomon can. And so David had to <coughs> communicate that vision, something he couldn't do, but his son could. And then, of course, later on, Zerubbabel building the temple again. And Paul spreading the word of God across Europe you know, and that was conducted, the author of that was the Holy Spirit saying, well, often we came through prayer, set aside Paul, set aside Silas, you know, the man from Macedonia coming and they had to 
change direction. They were prevented from going into one place and had to go to another because they were so in tune with God and they knew the direction in which they needed to go. So those are some examples of vision. So we're going to look at just a, uh, a few pointers, if you like. Uh, I shan't read through those, but we'll, you know, these are some of the things we're going to we're going to look at. So we'll look at uh, point one, sort of uh, hearing from God. So um, now a few years ago, I was praying, and I just saw this picture in my mind. That's one of the ways God speaks to me. Um, and uh, I just was reminded of Revelation and the four horses. So now, maybe, I mean, I had been to Versailles Gardens many years ago, and I don't know whether my mind flashed back to that, or whatever it was, it was the Garden Revelation. And it was quite clear to me, the four horses and the gates and different things. And about that time, I took a funeral for uh, a, a fairly elderly lady, which had asked me to take the funeral. And I was uh, in that funeral, of course, that beautiful verse in my father's house on many rooms. And so the garden had like revelation down on the front with the gates. Behind it was like the 23rd Psalm. It makes me lie down in green pastures. And then round the side, there were four gardens. There was searching, there was contemplation, there was love, and then the last one was going out with joy. And so what I was able to do was give the students a garden each, but in my father's house and many rooms. So it became a combination of in prayer, this revelation. And that was a garden we did, I think, about three years ago at Gardeners World. And it, and it just, things dropped into place really nicely for, for pretty much all the way through there. Now, it doesn't always happen that way, and that doesn't need to say, oh, that must be from God then. Because we know in the Bible that often, if you look at Nehemiah, for example, there are plenty of opposition. It wasn't plain sailing. But that's where that came from. There's a beautiful book called The Whisper by Mark Matteson. I don't know if you've read it. About how God speaks to people. And if, you, if I was to conduct a very simple experiment here now, and I said to you, just whisper something to the person next to you. Okay, whisper something. Just, just, just whisper something to the person next to you. Now, do you notice there was something that happened? I, wasn't, I hope it wasn't, I hope he finishes quicker, I've got to get with it. <laughs> if you notice, there was something that happened there, something visually, certainly for me, standing in the front, there was something that had to happen. One, you had to listen very carefully. You had to lean in. Okay, and that's, you have to lean in and really shut out other things and lean in, just like when God spoke to Elijah. It wasn't in the earthquake or it wasn't in fire or anything like that. It was in the whisper, wasn't it? And if we can shut out things and tune into God, we might just hear that whisper, what he's trying to say to us. So, conceived in prayer. And then, of course, you know, we've got our, our sort of vision, if you like, on the, the next one you can see here, well that was the bit, it actually wasn't far off the picture that I did originally when Sue uh, approached me. We did it, I couldn't sure put that in actually, I have put many pictures in the garden in. Um, but that was fairly close to, to, to what it was. And often what happens is people say, look, we, we've got this need. We need to get people to meet outside and sit and talk and different things. I know when I did the DRI sensory garden, the nurses there said we need somewhere to rehabilitate, you know, for, for people who've had a stroke to be able to go for a walk on different surfaces, build the confidence. So often it comes from a sort of a, a, a burden, a need to do something. And then, of course, um, it comes from someone maybe interpreting that um, and, and, and sort of putting that into, in, into action. So that's sort of... Often it's combined with a burden and a plan together. This is another one. The next one is another one I've been working on and, I, and uh, in, in the last few days. It's a fallen down barn. It's a cow shed which is falling apart as well. Now that may not mean 
I locked anybody in the room, of course. But it's where I kind of grew up, where I lived for 19 years. And what happened was we sold the majority of the land. So my mum had dementia, so we had to obviously put it in the home and the, the money paid for that. So I, I said, but I'd like to buy this bit of land, okay? Uh, because I think I can put a log cabin or something like that. And so that was the vision of it. But of course, once you've got a vision, <laughs> you know, you, you've got to have a plan. I'll just show you the next one, just to give you an idea of the, this sort of area, if you like. So this next one's just looking up onto the field. Something else we have to do is to, in faith, defend what is yours. Now there's a lovely reading in the Bible where Shammah, the, the Philistines, are attacking the Israelites. And the Israelites are more or less running and say, oh my goodness, they're coming. And, you know, uh, they're on the run. And then Shammah stops in this field of lentils. All it is is a field of lentils. It's not, you know, it's not sort of like some, you know, big sort of palace place. It's a field of lentils, and he, he kind of puts his spear in the ground and imagine, and he fights for it, and he pushes the Philistines back, just defending a field of lentils. You see, because when you look at things like this, you sort of think, and you look at Shammah. He, he will have worked with his dad, and his granddad, maybe his family for generations to create, you know, food for the family. And so he's looking at, it, at all that, and maybe he's looking at it for his children, grandchildren, whatever. And so, so you know, you start to build that into it. It becomes a bigger, you're a bigger stakeholder in it. And so that was just something, I just felt there was something in this, I don't know what yet, but I just felt I need to do something, okay? Because we could have just sold it all, bang, job, you know, that was it, it's gone. Um, so that was just, just something that, that you know, and we don't, I don't know exactly yet fully, uh, it might be a place where people come to rehabilitate, it's, it's the nice walks on the hills or whatever, but there was just something in me which said, now don't, you know, buy this land, so, you know, find out what the market price is, buy the land. There's a little story which I need to tell you in this, that, and you may have heard of this story, there was a gold prospector, and uh, he had a friend, we'll, we'll call the gold prospector Curly, and he had a friend, a, a close friend, they got to know each other really well, and anyway, Curly died. And so all the relatives suddenly came in and what's he, he was gold, but there must be gold here. So they're, they're, they're looking around, they're trying to find the gold. Where's his gold? Where's his gold? We need to, you know, it's our inheritance. They haven't seen Curly probably for years, but they just suddenly turned up wanting a bit of his gold. They didn't find it. But his friend went straight to the place, lifted the floorboard, and found the gold. And the reason he knew, he knew Curly and knew what he would do and where he would put it. And the more we get to know God, when we're talking about how do you get to know God's will, it's because Curly's friend spent time with him. He got to know him. Now in this case, although you know, you throw my mum dad out there, there, etc. But there was something about it, why they purchased that land. And something about it. It was something which resonated with me, as, as it probably would with you if you, you know, grew up in that place. And so sometimes there's just something else in it. And we don't know what God's plans are or who that might touch in the future. There might be someone really distressed in life in the future who needs that break. And I don't know, I don't know how it will transpire or how it will work out, but maybe that will restore them. The garden out there, Sue's already told me stories of people who've come and sat in there. Just a bit kind of at the last, you know, a lot of, at the end of the tether, if you like, and have just sat down, I've got to make a decision, and it's just contemplated for a while. They look up, they see Broadway Baptist Church. 
Maybe there's a tract and they just pick it up and read it. But it's all vision, isn't it? It's all vision. And of course, if you're going to have a vision, you need a plan. <laughs> so we kind of have a, a plan or a picture. It's a sort of picture it might look like when the cow says, we're out of the way at the barn. And then you have a plan, of course, and everybody needs some kind of plan. And it's good to plan well and plan effectively at the beginning particularly. Um, that's really important. When you come to do it, sometimes you need people who are going to push things on a little bit, and maybe not the detail, but you kind of certainly need a good plan. And uh, that's what Nehemiah was doing when he was surveying and planning and making sure that, you know, it was going to, going to all happen. Um, and on to this next one. Of course, if we tune into God, it's just that bit in red. The Lord showed me how his temple is to be built. It's incredible detail, isn't it? When you look at the tabernacle, when you look at the temple, the detail, the weaving on the curtain, the Ark of the Covenant, in every little bit of detail was there from God. And the more we lean into God, the more detail we get. It's interesting when we look at the next one, the leverage. Um, it's interesting when they built the temple, they went to Haram from Tyre. Hang on a minute, he's a, he's a, he's a pagan man. Haram from Tyre, and yet David had cedar logs from him. And he, he told you know, Solomon all about go to Haram, they're good builders. If you remember when the Israelites left Egypt, God softened the hearts of Egyptians and they gave them gold. So the very people whom they were upset against were the ones who provided. Even in the New Testament, you know, in, 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 in Herod's um, daughter was one of the people who funded the missions in, Acts, in the Acts of the Apostles. Because the earth is the Lord's and everything in it, it's all God's. So we don't need to be scared of asking people for help. We have incredible leverage because, you know, God is there on our side. And uh, so, so, you know, we have that. And uh, certainly David and Solomon use that. So whether Christian or non-Christian, when you do a project, obviously you can pray about that just in case. You don't want the wrong people on the inside, that's for sure. You know, you don't want the sun ballot stopping your build and the people like that. But you can ask for help outside of that. And so we we'll just get on to, so that was Haram, look at that. A uh, big role in constructing the temple. Who would have thought that? Uh, <laughs> the Egyptians got soft in their hearts and there you go. You've got Johanna, the wife of Herod's steward, Shusa, and, and Susanna, which provided the resources for the missions in the New Testament. And of course, one of the next things we need is we need willing volunteers. And we've already heard about some of those volunteers, and many of you in this church are volunteers, which is brilliant. You know what, there's a, there's a rule, isn't there? They talk about this rule, and, and, and part of me doesn't like this rule. It's called the 80-20 rule, the Pareto Principle. And what they say is that 80% of the work is done by 20% of the people, don't they? That's in, in most things. Okay, and people say, no matter how hard you try, it's very hard to get over that 20%. But, but, but we're all gifted. You know, everybody in this room is given a gift from God. You've all got talents. Wouldn't it be great if that, if that turned around, you know, and, and suddenly 100% all put effort and work and use their talents and gifts? Wouldn't that, wouldn't that be great? Because that's what God wants us to do ultimately, isn't it? Is to use our gifts and talents. And, um, you know, whether you're like Dorcas, Dorcas was brilliant. Just made clothes for people who are poor. Now, Dorcas didn't mind whether they got a, a, a badge, a bat badge. It wouldn't have bothered Dorcas. I'm sorry, I don't need your badge. I just do this. I do it out of love. I do it out of my mission. 
I do it because I enjoy it. Jesus said, be content with your pay. You know, because I just, I'm just being who I am and I love doing it. I'm in the flow of what I'm doing. That was a Dorcas, you know, and there are lots of, lots of other people like Dorcas who, who, who you know, bat men, bat women who, who did things. So it's, it's important in our Christian lives to be able to flow in our gifts. I can usually tell when I'm not happy is because I can't flow. I kind of not, but you can't. People, now clip your wing. I'm going to clip your other wing. Now you can move. Well, I can't actually do what I want to do because, now uh, there can be a reason for that, of course, and you have to weigh that up. But if it's, if it's some other reason and you just can't quite flow, because God wants us to flow. Now, part of me apologises, I know this is the last sea some tongue, whatever his name is, I don't even know. But I just saw this, and I thought it was quite interesting, and I know it's, uh, it's not a Christian, initially a Christian message, be still like a mountain and flow like a great river. But I thought, well, that, you know, in a way, it's like, yeah, we have to enter God's peace, don't we? He prepares a banquet, God says. But then the other side of the presence of our enemies. So we've got peace, be still like a mountain in our Christian minds. So at times you've got to be, be, be still and know that I'm God. And at other times you can flow. And it's, it's kind of that balance, isn't it, in our lives, in our Christian lives. But it was quite interesting just to see that. I thought, um, you know, that was quite a, a useful thing. And of course, if we're going to achieve these things, then we're going to hit a few... Um, oh, this is something else. That's right you cannot touch the same water twice because the flow that has passed will never pass again. Enjoy it the moment you like. Well, this is another reading it. But I thought it was quite nice how when we're flowing, you know, our water, we don't, we don't kind of, once it's gone, it's kind of moved on, isn't it? And so enjoy that bit of water while you can and, and enjoy that time while you can with the people you are. I'm, I'm not doing a, uh, you know, a, a thing here for, um, I forgot what it's called. <laughs> Where, 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 where you're caught in the moment, um, you know, but it's still, that's still important, you know, like, like be a Mary with Jesus. I'm going to enjoy this moment with Jesus, that moment. Yes, I know there's things to do, but I'm going to enjoy this moment having a conversation with this person with a coffee after. I'm not going to be thinking, like, who do I need to talk to? I'm just going to enjoy the moment. And, uh, you know, there's something, something in that. Okay. Um, you can be an encourager like Barnabas was to the early church when someone's got a vision, can't you? <clears throat> vision is really hard to get, get going sometimes. <laughs> Once people can see what's happening, it's a bit like the garden. If you saw that pile of rubble, not rubble, but stones, if you came then you thought, what on earth are they doing? I must admit, when I saw the pile of stones, I thought, oh my goodness, have I ever done this? And uh, and it's hard then to, 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 to see it, but as soon as it starts to take shape, oh yeah, I can see it now, people jump on. But that initial phase is quite hard and it takes people like Barnabas, I call it the kick-start principle. Barnabas stole the field and he gave it to the disciples for the apostles and they were able to get the mission started. And one of the best things you or I can do when someone has a vision and it's really good, is to contribute into that vision at that point. It just gets things moving. It's just like the kickstart on a bike. And it gets you up and running. And once you're up and running, and you've got a bit of time, and you, you write a few letters or different things, and one or two other things come in, you're away. We built a lovely garden in Langley Mill for, sadly, a young lad who died at the school. And we had a small amount of money to kickstart it wrote letters to, I said, everybody we're connected with, write a letter to, have they got wood, have they got um, stone, gravel, etc, etc. And after day one, I thought we've got enough for day one, we've got enough for day two, after that I'm stuck. Day, so day two, late on in the afternoon, the concrete pledge came in, the paving slab pledge came in, the wood came in. In fact, in the end, when we opened the garden, We'd, we'd wanted eight tonne of stone, we'd already had four, built it out of the four, and the other four was coming through the gate as we were having this celebration, like you are today, because God sometimes provides more. 
There's 12 baskets sometimes left over, aren't they? His cup overflows. This measure is pressed down, squashed together. And yeah, that's the way God works. And so someone to kick, kick start. So obviously you can motivate, and the motivation here was incredible. I try to motivate some of my, my two of my boys, Josh and Adam, with bacon butties, but it was incredibly good. Adam, people who um, brought drinks, and uh, you know, food and different things like that. It was it was great. So that was taking down the cow ass. But of course, as we all know, things don't always go to plan. And uh, the next one, as you see, <laughs> oh, sorry, have I not got that? Oh, yeah, I must have put that in after. Sorry, this was a. This this is actually. I'm sure you all know, or a number of you know this. I remember reading this and it spoke to me. And it's, it's one of my anchors in life, this is. Especially as you get older. A ship in a harbour is safe, but that's not where a ship is meant to be, or a ship is built for. You're not meant to just have your feet up all the time. You are. Plenty of time to do it, but you, you know, I'm not, because balance is good and, and rest is good and he makes me lie down in green pastures is good. Don't get me wrong on this. But is there anything in your life today that you need faith for? Is there anything you're doing today where you require faith? I'm not talking about just faith believing in Jesus, because when we die, we're gonna go to heaven. I'm talking about what are we stepping out in faith? And it's nice to have the ship in the harbour for a while, but the real adventures are on the seas, where you need a bit of faith. And God says without faith it's impossible to please God. And so we need to draw into God and say, God, what do you want me to do? Because at the moment I'm operating within my resources, I'm operating within my what I get capable of lifting. But what do you want me to do? Where well, I've got to rely on you. And I think it's that, and, and that spoke to me. It speaks to me. Well, certainly the last five years, and there's something similar usually each year that comes up, which just sort of says, "No, don't rest up. You got to keep moving. Got to keep doing it. Keep, keep, you know, doing things." And so. I, I, it's just something which, which I hope you can draw from that. And, uh, you know, most of the time, you step back. So in this case, I got a five-ton digger. I, we got a couple of tractors and trailers. I have to put a big sewage system in. Water to drain the surface water and different things. So it's all nice. You can get the kids to have a go on the digger. And it's all going really quite nicely. And you can have a lot of fun. And you've got little stories to tell. Uh, but then, of course, there's the other side where <laughs> maybe we did need that shuttering. <laughs> and uh, I'm not talking about that risk, by the way. That's not a good risk. But uh, I have got uh, someone who was uh, very proficient at that point. But uh, unfortunately, the ground did, did slide away on that. Uh, we're going to hit problems. We're going to hit situations where we hit the red wall, we sometimes call it, uh, you know, or the red zone, hit the wall. You're on a project and you hit a wall and it's as if that time there's no way we're stuck. We really are stuck here. Nehemiah hit that wall lots of times, you know, it was almost like, oh my goodness, this is it. When you're running a marathon, you hit that red zone and you think, oh my goodness, how would we get through this? And yet, when you turn to God, just like Nehemiah, turn to, to, turn to God, and that's what, hear us, our God, for we are despised. Turn their insults back on their own heads. Give them over as plunder in a land of captivity. Do not cover up their guilt or blot out their sins from your sight, for they have thrown insults in the face of the builders. So we rebuilt the wall until all of it reached half its sight, for the people worked with all their heart. How beautiful it is when a church, when everybody is, is all, all hearted and working all hard, not they wouldn't put their shoulders to the task. And it's just incredible what you can achieve when you've got a vision, 
when you've got a burden, when you've got a vision, when you've got that lovely unity and people buying into the vision, when you've got Barnabas to kick start it, when you've got people covering it in prayer, you know, that's exactly what these different things need. But you all are a back person and everybody here can get involved in some way. Just ask. And you know, that, that would be incredible. It'd be incredible what you do. You're already doing incredible things and people will be drawn in. But you can do even more. You know, hopefully this will, will, will be you know, what, what you've achieved already, give you incredible confidence for the future. And so um, I'll just pray and then I'll finish. There is one other slide. Uh, so we moved on. So that was a septic tank, it? <laughs> Which, fortunately, by the grace of God, because <laughs> I couldn't finish, that was the last thing I did. And fortunately, uh, a neighbour, so again, I went to a neighbour and said, Oh, you're a host, but I think I need to fill this septic tank because I want to have time to concrete it in. So we filled the septic tank with water to give it weight to hold because they're like, they're like a lightweight balloon. And uh, sure enough, by about uh, the next day, the, 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 the trench around it, the hole around it, was full of water. So it's a good job you did that. That tank would have been <laughs> floating <laughs> up in the sky. Um, so, you know, it enables you to press on. You overcome those problems and you get through them because God will give you that solution uh, to that problem. So let's pray. Praise your name, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Holy Spirit, we just thank you. We thank you for the way you directed evangelism in the Acts of the Apostles. And I pray, Lord, your blessing upon this church from Rochelle and the whole team. Lord Jesus, that you would guide them and wear them to go next. I pray, Lord Jesus, that young men, old men will dream dreams, will have visions, and they will step forward and write down the vision, just like Habakkuk did, and put that forward, Lord Jesus. I pray that volunteers will come, will arise, and want to be part of it, but don't want to miss it. We pray that there will just be such a, an atmosphere of encouragement and care and support and love. But ultimately, Lord, we pray that all these things will reach more and more people. We shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. We shall be witnesses of Judea, Samaria, Derby, and to the ends of the earth. Thank you so much, Mike. <coughs> Lots of food for thought there as we come up to our annual meeting and uh, some of the things you've touched on this morning crosses over what I wrote in the um, beginning of our annual meeting reports. We're going to finish with one more hymn. And as Mike has been uh, speaking on vision, of course, the one vision that we want to drive all things is the vision of God being at the helm. Be thou my vision, O Lord of my heart. What is the problem? What is the Thou my vision, O Lord of my heart, not be all else to me, save that Thou art. Thou my best thought, by day or by night, waking or sleeping, Thy prayer. My life Be thou my wisdom And thou my true 
Yes, was it? 70% chance of rain got less and less, and then it crept back up to 40, but it's dry for us. Hooray. 
A man was working on his garden when the vicar walked by to bless the man's work. May you and God work together to make this the garden of your dreams. A few months later, the vicar stopped by again. Lo and behold, the garden was completely transformed. There were no weeds. The beds were full of colourful flowers. Amazing, said the vicar. Look what God and you have accomplished together. Yes, said the gardener. But remember what the place was like when God was working it alone. <laughs> God's been at work in this garden and he's been helped by a team of professional and amateur gardeners. Firstly, Mike Baldwin from Broomfield College, whose creativity is driven by his faith in God. Thank you, Mike. What a privilege and a pleasure it has been to work alongside you. Mike has won awards at Chelsea. He's very modest. <laughs> He's also won awards at Gardeners World Live. His quiet confidence, his knowledge about design, his skill with people and with building materials is inspirational. Thanks all also to his Batman. If you were in church this morning, you'd understand what I mean. They're both successful designers themselves and they're former students of Mike. There's also Adam, who's Mike's son, who helped to build this Derbyshire stone bench. There's our amazing caretaker, Martin Whitney. Woo! There's Chris Elliott, wave Chris. Chris is a volunteer who put us all to shame with his builder's outfits. And David and Heather Bryan, there's Helen, Heather, from this church. Together as a team, we built cheerfully in the sun, less cheerfully in the rain, and very grumpily in a snow, snowstorm blizzard. Thank you also to the Derbyshire Foundation who generously gave us a grant towards this project and to the Broadway Church who encouraged us and provided the remaining funds. But the garden hasn't only been about builders. Others, too numerous to mention, have used mattocks to clear the rockery, spades, forks and trowels to help create the garden, and some have lovingly sanded and revarnished benches, which aren't here at the moment. Others have mown the lawn, and some teams have cut the hedges. And talking of hedges, that's where it all began. Our hedge creations began in COVID. They've been twice on local television and in the Baptist Times. Special mention to Jew and Nick and Alan Constable. Where's Alan? Who've, who've all helped us create memorable displays. We enjoy making these displays most of the time. <laughs> but most of all, we enjoy talking to you. Instead of being a barrier, our hedge has now become a window to the outside world. The garden will continue to evolve. That's what gardens do. But today is about saying, this is your garden. It's here for your pleasure and relaxation. 
Please use it to sit, relax, reflect and be drawn away from the madness of the world to a place more reminiscent of the world God first created in the Garden of Eden. Two quotes to finish. Audrey, Audrey Hepburn said, to plant a garden is to believe in tomorrow. We believe in tomorrow and this garden is testament to that. And a British poet, Minnie Aumonier said, when the world wearies, and doesn't it feel a bit weary at the moment, and society fails to satisfy, there's always the garden. I'd like to invite Mike to formally open the Broadway Community Cup. Sue, so, you cannot organise every last detail. <laughs> and I think it would be really remiss not to acknowledge the vision, the planning, the hard work, the tenacity of getting funding. And when we thought it's, oh, that will do. There was another <laughs> bit of the vision to develop and it wouldn't be here without you. So we want to say a huge thank you. And we've got some flowers, Gabriel, come and get those. There we are. So Gabriel's got some flowers for you. Mike, I've given you some scissors that probably aren't adequate, but anyway, <laughs> would you like to come and formally open our garden for us? And thank you so much. Thank you, Sue. Well, it's been a privilege to uh, been involved with the garden, so I declare this garden hopefully open. Yeah.